Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for the introduction and for hosting me. Um, it's really lovely to be here. And thank you all for coming. Um, so since it's not a huge group, I actually was wondering if maybe we could go around quickly and introduce ourselves. If people just want to say their name, um, you know, what their connection to the university is, if you're you know, a student or a faculty or a visitor. Um, and if there's one quick thing you either, either that brought you here today or that you were kind of a question that you had, um, nothing long, just to get a sort of sense of, of what people are kind of thinking and what people already are kind of know about. So maybe we start over here and go around. Alberto, Alberto Vargas, I'm the associate director of the BASIS, Latin American Studies program. Um, well, I've been very interested in this topic from day one. From I was in, in Quintana Roo in January 1st. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's something that has been much in my mind. Great, thank you. Francisco Scarano, director of BASIS and historian. But of the Caribbean, um, of course, interested in Zapatista and the in general. Thank you. That's a little um, red for me, very Latin American studies. Angela Bongiorno, the financial specialist for Marcy. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Should we go back here and then around? Sure. My name is Becky Smith, and I'm an advisor in the School of Education. And I just have a general interest in, in the topic and, and just love all the, I mean, they've done so many great lectures. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, I'm Sarah Ritz from as well. And, um, I'm here because we coordinated the lecture, but also I studied abroad in Mexico during undergrads so many years ago, but um, I've always wanted to learn more about this topic, so I'm excited to hear your talk today. Great, thank you. I'm Josh Schwartz, and I'm an undergraduate student, and that's the last interview. Great. I'm Stephen Osnard, Department of AOS. I came here half a century ago from El Salvador. Welcome, 50 Ed, years ago. Ed, <laughs> Ed Fo, yeah, I'm an alumni, but I'm also currently taking a course in uh, global language issues. But uh, I always come on <laughs> these things, and uh, it, isn't, it has to be a very bad lecture for me not to show up. <laughs> okay, so I'll take this as this is not a very bad lecture. <laughs> I'm very flattered. <laughs> um, so great, thank you, everybody. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I spent several years in Chiapas, Mexico, um, so from about 1997 to 2003. And um, mm -hmm. it sounds like this group is fairly familiar with the Zapatista movement. Is, that, is there anyone here who would, say, who would say that they are not familiar with the Zapatista movement? OK. Um, so just well, to. You, you cannot be yes, and you cannot be no. So this is sort of the thing sure. yes. here yes. yes, definitely. Um, <laughs> just getting a general sense. Um, so, 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 so my time was spent there working with women's cooperatives primarily. Um, when I was about, I was 19 or 20 when the Zapatista uprising oh. happened in 1994. <laughs> and uh, it was a time when, you know, for those of, but folks who are sort of my age or older, you might kind of remember this or, or have your own associations with that time period. It was kind of at the tail end of the Cold War, and you know the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, and there was this kind of sense of, you know, what were popular movements going to look like? What were kind of the next wave of social movements going to look like? And there was the right wing kind of proclaiming the end of history and capitalism and the free market has won, and you know that's clearly not true. But it was just, a, it was sort of unclear, you know, necessarily what, 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 how things would kind of shake out. Um, so I think the Zapatista uprising came along at a time that was really interesting um, in that sense of this kind of presenting one alternative or one option of what social movements kind of could look like in that, in that sort of post-Cold War time period. Um, are there, so are there, 
you know, as you said, I don't, you know, it's obviously people are somewhere in the middle, but what if people, could people just throw out, like, what are your general associations with the Zapatista movement? So we just, like I said, it sounds like people here are somewhat familiar, but so we kind of have some shared, this is kind of what the Zapatista movement is background. What do people, what do people generally associate with the EZLN or the Zapatista movement? Well, I can say, um, perhaps um, aided by um, a number of students, graduate students we have from Mexico, that it's actually the most recent of, well, not the most recent, but the, the largest of the recent um, um, insurrections um, that indicate the, the, um, the profound instability of Mexican society and mm -hmm. particularly its uh, political regime. Yes, absolutely. So that's actually, this is the first slide I have here is, you know, so people know the Zapatista movement is located in Mexico, and this is the um, this is the state of Chiapas. So you know, I think as you're kind of referring to, there the state of Chiapas is both very um, high concentration of indigenous people, um, but also very high concentration of poverty, marginalization, and ironically, you know, sort of center of Mexico. Like the, there's a lot of natural resources in Chiapas that end up getting kind of sent up to central and northern Mexico. There's a lot of hydroelectricity, for example, um, that gets sent up to central northern Mexico, even as those rural villages don't have electricity or running water themselves. So it's, it's a beautiful state, um, but it is, you know, there are a lot of those contradictions. So, and I think something else you kind of hinted at, there was, you know, they, the Zapatistas very much come out of a, a legacy of indigenous resistance. So there's, you know, been 500 plus years of indigenous resistance. They also really come out of the Mexican Revolution, the legacy of the Mexican Revolution. Um, in 1910, you know, so the, the Zapatista, the word Zapatista, of course, comes from Emiliano Zapata, who was a hero of the Mexican Revolution, and his banner was land and freedom. So they sort of took that up, but then, you know, expanded it to many other demands. So speaking of which, what, so what do people associate the Zapatista movement kind of fighting for? Mm -hmm. Like land. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So land rights, indigenous rights. Um, they uh, so I think on the one hand they, they 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 represent a very specific kind of context of rural indigenous villages in Chiapas, um, and at the same time, have put out these kind of very broad universal demands that people around the world could really relate to. So justice, freedom, democracy, um, housing, education for all land rights. So, you know, I think it was, like I said, very specific to Chiapas and at the same time, very kind of universal. So this is Chiapas. Um, and this is just, this is kind of the official map. So you see, you know, the capital and then the different kind of regions. Many of those um, specific towns were taken over in the 1994 uprising. So, you know, San Cristóbal de las Casas was the most kind of well-known uprising. Um, but this uprising was very brief. So 1994, it lasted really just about a week. In many places, it wasn't even violent. Um, in Ocosingo, it was. So in Ocosingo, up, in Ocosingo is up here. Um, there was actual combat. But the, the uprising very quickly turned into, so the EZLN continues to have, um, on the one hand, a revolutionary army, which still exists, although they haven't used their weapons since 1994. And on the other hand, it's a broad kind of social movement that is, you know, uses political strategy, um, peaceful mobilizations, dialogue with civil society. Is there, is that your hand up? You have a, a comment or a question? Just a question uh -huh. on that. But the, the southernmost edge of the, uh -huh. of the port, that's where the railway comes in from Guatemala and then sort of through and gets to the other side of the ocean, the other uh -huh. ocean isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so right, as you mentioned, so Guatemala is here, so it's the southernmost, um, mm -hmm state and so you know and people are people and goods are traveling up sort of through Central America mm -hmm. into Mexico and uh, sometimes up to the US Does this is the function that railway? I'm sorry Does that railway still I don't know honestly I'm sorry um, so, so then this is actually the same map but with kind of Zapatista territory mm -hmm. so as they carried out these the the uprising they also took over land in a lot of this region so this kind of shaded area is what's considered Zapatista territory and as you mentioned, it being a struggle for land, um, 
land has historically been concentrated in, in the hands of very few people in Chiapas, you know, ever since colonialism. Um, you know, with the Mexican Revolution and, and the land reform that came after that, there was some land reform, but um, historically less than in other parts of Mexico. So there were still, you know, there, there weren't the same kind of huge plantations, they're called fincas in Chiapas, but there was still land concentrated in the same kind of few wealthy families that were historically um, descended from the Spanish, from the kind of colonial elite. And so in a lot of this area, especially kind of here around these canyons, they took over pretty vast um, pieces of land and redistributed it to indigenous uh, families who, who historically had owned that land. Um, you know, and then indigenous peasants had worked on these fincas pretty much as indentured servants for centuries. Um, so the reason the line is kind of jagged is that it's not kind of rebel-held territory in the traditional sense of here's kind of the line and everyone inside this line, you know, is one thing and everyone outside is. There's, there's sort of Zapatistas and non-Zapatistas living side by side in this territory. Um, and the, well, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but the Zapatistas have a whole kind of developed alternative, almost like a state system, but the Mexican state also does exist in this in this area, you know, they, they sort of coexist. So that sort of jagged edge indicates that, like it's considered Zapatista territory, but not in that kind of traditional, like rebel held sense. Does that make sense? Um, so, and you know, and I think it's important to understand some of the conditions that were, you know, and probably this is familiar to some of you either from this context or from other contexts in Latin America that were similar. Um, that you know, both the, the, the level of poverty, the level of mar mar marginalization, um, like I said, the, the sort of history of indigenous people still, up until 1994, many of them still working on these fincas. Um, and women in particular faced a very intense level of marginalization. So on top of one of the Zapatista women leaders once said, Zapatista women are oppressed three times over because we're indigenous, because we're poor, and because we're women. So they were kind of facing all of those types of discrimination. And so women in particular um, couldn't really leave their homes without permission from their husband or their fathers. They were married oftentimes very young, against their will, um, had 10, 12, sometimes 15 children because they had very limited access to birth control. And because they were so confined to the private sphere, all this sort of realm of decision making, public affairs was very dominated by men. So there was this very kind of extreme sense of you know women in the home and you know men in the sphere of um, of decision making. So even though indigenous men were also very much impacted by you know the race and the the economic subjugation within the villages, there was they still were kind of more the ones um, you know kind of running things. So that's just kind of background. Um, uh, a couple other things really quick. Do people know why? The Zapatistas chose uh, January 1st, 1994 as the day of their uprising. You're nodding your head. Yes. Would you like to share with us? I think NAFTA would do fine. Yeah. Huh. Everyone knows what NAFTA is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the free, not North American Free Trade Agreement um, went into effect that day. And so this is an example of how, on the one hand, the EZLN, and the EZLN stands for the Zapatista Army of National Liberation. In Spanish, it's the Ejército Zapatista de Liberación Nacional. Um, so when I say the EZLN, the Zapatista movement, kind of interchangeable. Um, but so they, you know, like I said, were coming out of this long history of indigenous resistance and at the same time recognized kind of neoliberalism as the current state of global capitalism that was just going to be devastating for indigenous communities. And they were right. You know, many of us have seen since then, you know, the, the impact on rural Mexico that NAFTA has had. Um, so they they identified neoliberalism and, and the free trade in particular as going to be like a death sentence almost for indigenous people. And that's kind of connected to they, the, the EZLN, like I mentioned, they, they, they continue to have a rebel army, but since 1994 have been known much more for this kind of broad, as a broad social movement, their marches, their political mobilizations, they negotiated a peace treaty with the Mexican government it was about specifically about indigenous rights and culture, um, which was signed but never implemented by the Mexican government, and also this dialogue with civil society. 
So they've hosted a lot of encuentros, these kind of gatherings or events in their territory where people come from around Mexico and around the world to share ideas, um, share strategies, and help kind of build networks. And so they haven't been the kind of revolutionary movement that took over state power and kind of caused transformation that way. But I think they've had a really tremendous ripple effect in terms of the change that they've helped to create, certainly in their own region, um, but also throughout Mexico, and really kind of inspiring people around the world. And in particular, going back to neoliberalism, I think they very much helped plant the seeds of the kind of anti-globalization movement in the late 90s. Um, a lot of the sort of mobilizations and protests that came out, you know, the movement against the, the protests in Seattle, all that kind of stuff, point back, many of them point back to some of those gatherings held by the Zapatistas where they really identified neoliberalism as kind of the, the source of the problem in a lot of ways. Um, so that's all sort of background. Um, is there anything anyone wanted to add that they kind of just feel like is important about the Zapatista movement? Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think it was so much about free trade. It was about, in, within that agreement, uh, the uh, big American companies were sort of like authorized to, to come in and take over large areas of land so that they could produce uh, mm -hmm. products. And that went directly in contra to the the government uh, agreement with the Indians that they would be able to have their land. So it was like, a, it was like the straw that broke the camel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In 1992, in fact, I'm not sure if you're specifically referring to this, but in 1992, um, Carlos Salinas, who was president of Mexico at the time, changed the, Mexico, the Mexican Constitution to allow the ejido system, which was the kind of collective land system that came, um, that came out of the Mexican Revolution, historically has deeper roots, but kind of in that, in its, in that manifestation came out of the, the Mexican Revolution, um, changed that so that those parcels of land could be bought and sold. And the Ejido system historically had been this way to kind of to um, protect collective, collective land rights. Um, and so I think that was like the Zapatistas yeah. very much identified. This was, you know, an example of where, where the Mexican state was headed. So turning a little bit more to the, the subject of, of my book and the time that I spent down there, um, and then we'll come back again to some of the, the um, one of the themes I wanted to share was kind of the Zapatista movement as an alternative to global capitalism. So we'll come back to that in a minute. But so, you know, like I mentioned, I spent about six years there. I worked mostly with women's cooperatives. Um, I went down at a time, I went down there originally for six weeks mm -hmm. and ended up staying for six years. So you can see it was a very compelling time. Um, and it was, you know, I think for me partially, someone mentioned, um, you know, they've always been interested in, in the, the relationship between women and social movements. And that was kind of what I really saw unfolding in that, in that moment. I had actually done my, my undergraduate senior thesis on the women's movement that came out of the Sandinista revolution, sort of after the Sandinistas lost.